So I know digestive histology isn't everyone's favorite topic, but actually, GI histology is pretty cool when you take a look at it. I think the reason that people don't like histology is that it all looks like a bunch of schmutz on a slide if you don't know what you're looking for. The cuts can be a little weird, distorting the architecture in a way that's not intuitive to a person just learning this stuff. So, I'm just going to go ahead and juxtapose histology slides with my own diagrams, just to show you the reason that cells are organized in the way they are. Is that right? Is that right? The esophagus is made up of stratified squamous epithelium, pretty much the same stuff that's on your skin, with cuboidal cells on the bottom, their huge nuclei, that means they're actively replicating, pushing new cells up to the top. As the cells mature closer to the top, they develop an interlocking shape characteristic of this tissue type, and the nuclei get smaller because they're losing their potential to divide. The top cells are constantly sloughing off, and the cuboidal cells at the bottom have to divide constantly to keep up with this loss. On a non-mucosa-related note, it's worth mentioning that the esophagus represents kind of an interesting transition between striated muscle at the upper third to smooth muscle at the middle and lower thirds. Anyway, the esophageal mucosa changes abruptly from non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium to simple columnar epithelium, and this type of epithelium predominates for pretty much the rest of the GI tract, so it can be a little bit tricky to distinguish them. I'll help you guys out. To distinguish the gastric mucosa, first of all, it has a number of gastric pits, which increase the surface area for mucus production. But these are pretty superficial and nondescript when compared to the gastric glands, which are identified primarily by the basophilic cells down on the bottom. These are the chief cells, and they're responsible for secreting pepsinogen, the protein-chomping enzyme that gets activated only once it's released into the gastric lumen. Pretty smart chief cells. Now these glands are pretty bulbous on the bottom and can be irregular, so don't be too surprised if you can't see a gland all the way from top to bottom like in this diagram, but rather just as a couple of basophilic cross-sections like down here. The three segments of the small intestine share a very similar architecture, and it's not hard to see why. The whole point of the small intestine is to absorb as many nutrients as possible, which it accomplishes by using villi to increase the surface area. Each villus is a unit that contains its own arterial, capillary bed, and venule, as well as a lymphatic vessel for lipid transport called a lacteal. If you squint really hard at the diagram, you'll see that each individual cell also has little villus-like projections called microvilli. You're not going to see these on a histology slide, they're way too small, but it's conceptually important to know that they're there. Now the jejunum takes this folding process one step further and has circular infoldings of both mucosa and submucosa called plicae circularis. On the other end of the scale are the crypts of Lieberkuhn, which, among other things, serve as home to the stem cells that constantly regenerate new columnar cells that keep getting sloughed off. By some estimates, the lifespan of an epithelial cell in one of the villi is only about four days, so these crypts do an important job. The crypts also house the paneth cells, which act as important defensive cells that keep the poop bacteria in the GI tract and not in our bloodstream. Other than the plicae, there are a couple of things that allow you to distinguish between the different parts of the small intestine. The duodenum, having to neutralize the constant acidic efflux from the stomach, has to be ready with major quantities of bicarb at the drop of a hat. To that end, it has the Brunner's glands to help. These glands are incredibly densely packed, as you can see in the picture here, and are laden with a bicarbonate-rich mucus. Remember, B for Brunner's is also for bicarbonate. The ilium's claim to originality is the Pyre's patch, which is basically just a set of lymph nodes embedded in the submucosa, because by this point in the GI tract, the digestive glop churning around on your insides is starting to look an awful lot like poo. And if you've got that much bacteria-laden poo, you're going to need some pretty good immunologic defenses, in case one of those pathogens goes rogue. They're actually pretty distinctive, not too tough to spot. You can see this on the histology slide. One thing that's a little bit more difficult to spot, as you go down the small intestine from duodenum to jejunum to ileum, the proportion of goblet cells, that's the mucus-producing ones, increases. I wouldn't base your assessment on that, because it's kind of a subjective assessment, you'll be a lot better off looking for objective findings, like the presence of Brunner's glands, plicae circularis, and Pyre's patches. The colon and rectum mark the end of the GI tract, and they're only really notable for being super featureless. They have no villi or microvilli, just crypts. The only other interesting thing about the colon is that it has visibly more goblet cells than anything else, and this you can probably tell by just looking at it. And the main thing, though, is to not get these confused with the gastric pits, which also have a ton of mucus cells. The crypts, though, are generally a lot deeper, and of course, they're not surrounded by the gastric glands. So take another look at the gastric glands, burn that image into your head, know that that's how you're going to identify gastric mucosa as opposed to anything else. Anyway, good job staying with me through this. Time to reward your dedication with another Flash Quiz. Flash Quiz. What is the most distinguishing histologic characteristic for each of the three main divisions of the small intestine? Ready, go! 
So, the duodenum is characterized by the Brunner's glands, the tightly packed glands that secrete bicarbonate-infused mucus to neutralize stomach acid. The jejunum has nothing that really histologically defines it, but in some slides, if the resolution is low enough, you may see the macrostructure of plique circularis, the folds of mucosa and submucosa that increase the surface area even beyond what the villi and microvilli provide. Finally, the ileum contains Peyer's patches, lymphoid follicles buried in the submucosa that increase the enteric immunologic defense. The reason this is so important to remember is that the divisions of the small intestine do look pretty similar. All of them have villi, microvilli, and crypts of Lieberkuhn, so you need to be able to pick out which feature makes each one unique. 